everybody, this is Brian back with another episode of Grief to Growth. And today I've got with me Kat Morris. Uh, Kat is an adult educator specializing in adult learning. She's an intuitive empath. She is the mother of six children, four biological and two by marriage. And she's a founder and president of Captain Candace Cookie Ruiz Foundation. And we'll talk about that is and why Kat started that. Uh, in November 13th of 2020, Kathleen's oldest daughter, Candace, was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Candace was an active Marine trained to be an Osprey pilot. Uh, she received her pinning of wings on November 2020, shortly after diagnosis, and she was promoted to captain nine days before she transitioned into spirit on August 10th, 2021. And today, Kat and I are going to talk about, we're going to talk a lot about Candace, what a special person that she is. We're going to talk about Kat's journey of grief and Kat's transformation in starting this organization um, and her daughter's honor. So with that, I want to welcome to Grief to Growth, Kat Morris. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to, to see you again. It's great to have you here and talk about your very special daughter, Candace. So I'd like to start off by having you tell us about Candace. Yes, absolutely. Um, Candace was described as a very um, fun-loving, bright, magnetic human. She didn't know strangers, strangers didn't know her. She just had that ability about her that you feel gravitated towards her, that aura that you heard some people have, her big, bright smile and big blue eyes. And she was just so fun loving and helpful and very uh, focused on leadership ever since she was a little child. She loved leadership. It was just instilled in her from the moment that she was born. And I believe that that was what part of that essence that she radiated out of her, that draw on individuals to her, not just her family and her close friends, but just anyone that she came across. Um, but she was also a, she from the hip kind of gal. She told you like it was when you needed to hear it, even if it was tough to hear, but she would always walk away from that conversation saying, wow, I might, I might not have liked to hear that. It bruised me, but. I sure did need to hear that, right? And then so it helped you to develop. So she loved the community. She had been doing community service ever since she was six or seven years old. She and her older brother um, used to um, take their Christmas presents, their own Christmas presents. Candace had um, said, we're going to do this one year when she was six and um, talk with her brother and convinced him to do this with her and they took their own Christmas presents and went around through the neighborhood through the school the school had a, a present drive and um, went with the teacher the principal I believe and passed out presents to individuals that were less fortunate and from that moment that was her journey hmm. with community hmm. service she was bit by that bug and continued to do that and loved being a marine um, always aspired, did young Marines at 10 and 12 years of age. And so she was a very pitiful uh, uh, rock, a very strong pillar rock within our her community, no matter where she resided, with her, our family and with her friends. Um, and we love her and we know that she's always with us, but having that zest and memory of her, I believe is what keeps us all moving forward. We have a little bit of that zest of Candace in, inside of us. Yeah, and she was an athlete too, wasn't she? Yes, she was a rugby athlete. She started out with the passion of being a basketball player. When she was younger, she played basketball, well, really all sports. She was a very um, a well rounded athlete. She played all, all types of sports. But her passion mainly when she was younger was basketball. She loved Michael Jordan and um, wanted to be a pro female athlete playing basketball and did that process and was wonderful at it and earned athletic scholarships in school for that. And shortly um, in her high school year, she just started, I think, growing and stretching and, and exploring a little bit more and decided, you know what, came home one day and said, I'm not going to play basketball anymore. And my jaw was on the floor like, what? You've been doing this your whole entire life. Yeah. What happened? And she's like, you know what, mom? It's just not for me. It's not for me anymore. I'll find another sport. And she was not worried about, am I going to get a scholarship or not for my athleticism? She's like, it'll be okay. I'll, I'll find another sport. And two weeks later, she was about 15, 16 at the time, I believe. 
And um, she joined rugby. We had a local rugby team at our her high school, Kansas City Dragons. And she introduced me to her coach. And her coach shared with me, I had no idea what um, rugby was. It's not a predominant sport in um, in our city of Kansas City, Missouri, that I was aware of. Mm -hmm. and um, met with the coach and the coach just shared with me a little bit about what it was and went to the first uh, game and thought, what did I sign up for? What did I sign her up for? But yeah. He did amazing and loved it. And that community that she grew with as 16 growing up, that community really was and is her family and was there for her and my daughter-in-law and my granddaughter during her time of need with her battle with cancer. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it reminds me a little bit of my daughter. She played basketball from the time she was five until she was, I guess, about 14. And then she came home one day and said, I don't want to play basketball anymore. And the high school had already recruited her to play on the team, and she she switched to uh, volleyball. So, yeah. yeah. Is it funny how that happens, how they just know, right? Yeah, it is. And I, like I said, rugby, that's, that's, that's a tough one for a mother, I'm sure. Yes, but it, I have to tell you, like at first, yes, absolutely. But then I started getting a little bit more comfortable with this. I'm like, wow, I got a daughter that's a rugby player. Wow, you know, and we would watch her games and encourage her. And my daughter-in-law is a rugby athlete too. That's how they met. And um, it's just a beautiful sport and a wonderful um, family. Mm -hmm. They really do show. It's so much more than what we would think that it is if we were looking from the outside in. Yeah, I love rugby. I think it's fun. So yeah. did she join the Marines right after high school? Um, shortly, not not technically. She mm -hmm. started doing her uh, reservists. She was a reservist first, leading into that pathway. Okay. Yeah. And she was trained to be an Osprey pilot. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. she was. Um, and was uh, moved up the ranks quite very shortly. I, I believe that her time overall in the military was about 10 years, maybe a little longer, maybe a little over 10 years, but not more than maybe 10, 10 and a half years. Mm -hmm. So to be able to grow and stretch the way that she has um, in that short period of time with her ranks and with her knowledge is very, um, it's very exciting. And it's very um, admirable, uh, just showcases her character and her personality. Yeah. So then she got the bad news of the the diagnosis. Yes. We got that diagnosis. She was not feeling well for off and on for about um, a year, to, a year prior to that, but just didn't contribute it to anything. Like really just thought that, oh, maybe it's a uh, IBS or stress, or maybe I'm just not eating something. But then when she finally started getting like really severe um, symptoms back in 2020, it was right when COVID first started. Right. Mm -hmm. So she came to visit us and I noticed right away that she had lost a ton of weight and I was like, what are you doing? You've lost so much weight, Candace. You know, she's like, oh, I've been fasting. You know, I've been doing this. I've been doing that. But, you know, as a parent, you feel that gnawing feeling inside of you and, you know, something's not right, even though they're putting that brave face on. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just shared with her, I was like, Hey, come clean, come clean. What is wrong with you? You, I feel like you're sick. Like what's wrong. And she was like, mom, you know, starts telling me about her symptoms. And I was like, well, you need to get to the doctor and you need to get those checked because that's very serious, you know? So she did, she made an appointment. And at that time it was just so COVID crazy at that time. And they were not able to see her until December um, 13th. So many months later, many months later, she was able to get seen. And then when she did at that time, she got the diagnosis that it was stage four, um, colon cancer and that the tumors within her colon, she had one tumor at the beginning of her colon and one at the end. And that, um, the, the diagnosis was that they were inoperable. They were not able to be removed, but they did the treatment and she did fantastic with her treatment when she started. She started gaining weight. She started um, really looking um, not uh, like death's door, so to speak. Right. And, and started, you know, we had this We had this thing in our family um, that Marco Polo's, and she was the founder of our Marco Polo's, created that group. And she would always get on there, Marco Poloing us, 
just like she always had, you know, prior to her diagnosis and working in her house. Um, her and my daughter-in-law just recently uh, around this time in Colorado purchased a new home. So she was working on it and, and doing um, painting and stuff and videoing it and sharing that with us. And we're thinking this is a person that's been diagnosed with stage four cancer. Look at her, like to look at her, you would not know it from just the view of her after she started progressing. And then we would get updates about how the, um, the chemotherapy and radiation treatments were like 85% or 65%, you know, give us like these, these percentages of how it was um, decreasing. But the, the risk was is that she just didn't have that, that the cancer just in her colon, it had started spreading into other areas of her body her brain, her liver, other, other areas. Um, and then it got to the point to where the, um, oncologist, you know, shared that, you know, they're at the end that she, you know, wasn't going to be able to get the chemotherapy or radiation anymore. But before we got to that, she was out home. I mean, she would go do her treatments and um, it did take a toe on her, you know, but Physically, she still kept moving on, still had her fun, happy, go lucky, spunky personality, you mm -hmm. know, and it was around, I believe, um, shortly after she took a trip with her wife, Kittery and the baby, Kyliana to Mexico for some friends um, in May, shortly after she got back, she had an appointment to go and get her stents changed to shed kidney stents. Um, and so she had an appointment to go and get those checked and she shared on our Marco Polo, you know, they had a Routine, it's just a routine, you know, check up. I'm just going to go in, do, do this routine, stent change. Um, but during that time of doing that stent, um, the, uh, we we found out that um, they can't give you chemotherapy and any of that, inf any of that kind of treatment um, a certain period of time before you get your stent change, right? So mm. um, that happened and then they they did the stent change and she was still in the hospital. She kind of started running this fever and, and they couldn't figure out what was going on with her. Why is she running this fever? What's going on? She doesn't, you know, on the test, it doesn't look like there's any type of well-known infection, but there's definitely something going on because she's having a fever, right? So I remember sharing with her, Candace, I feel like you need to have them check, check, check that stent. I feel like that stent has been compromised. I feel like that stent, there's something wrong with that stent that's making you ill. Right. And she was like, mom, no, everything's okay. It's not the stent, something else. I'm like, please just ask him to check it. Please just ask him to look at it once again. And she did. And they ended up finding out that something was on, going on with that stent and was able to correct that. But by that time, her being off, um, you know, going into the hospital the entire month of, uh, of June, she was in there the entire month of July. So going on two months of uh, trying to figure out what's going on and in doing this, cancer is growing still inside of her, you know? So um, by the time that she did get home, um, she was able to stay at home for one day and then she went back. And then that was towards the last week of her life was when she um, got home, was able to celebrate with her wife and my daughter, her younger sister and her child, Kyliana, the celebration of her Captain Candace ranking. Mm -hmm. And um, shortly after that, she started having some bleeding um, and um, went bleeding, you know, in her urine and went back and then they admitted her and she stayed from that moment on and wasn't able to come back home. Oh, I'm I'm really sorry. I know that had to be uh, extremely difficult for, for you to go through. Were you able to be with her during that time? That's the whole thing is that it was so we had planned to go and see her. So uh, I saw her in July. Uh, we moved her younger sister down to Colorado to go to school down there and so that she could be close to her sister and help out as mm -hmm. um, a, a part of the care, care team. And um, Candace was always adamant. You know, when she got this diagnosis, she shared with me and in, in shortly after November the 13th, mom, I don't want this to change anybody's life. I do not want anybody to turn their life upside down for me because uh, I'm ready to pick up and go. I'm like, I'm, I'm right. I'm coming. Right, right. <laughs> like, no, mom, stay where you're at. Stay where you're at. You've seen all of the support that I have. I have this beautiful family here. I know that it's hard. 
on you because you're my mom, but I want you to stay there and do what you need to do and get yourself prepared because the family's going to need you more. If I, whenever I do transition, then I need you now. Wow. So yeah. she's like, you focus on you, you get yourself together and you get yourself right. And you focus on your work and you do what you need to do to get yourself prepared because one day you're going to have to leave this with path without me, mom. And I need for you to do that now. I think you need to take this time. Call me, come visit. But, you know, there's really no need in you being with me 24 hours a day. I think that the bigger need is for you to get yourself to absorb this. And in hindsight, I look at this, Brian, as like almost as if she was giving me a riddle, right? Almost as if she was giving me a sneak peek behind the curtain, right? Mm -hmm. When I look at it in hindsight now of, you need to get yourself ready. You need to, you need to handle yourself. You need to accept this for yourself. And at that time, I thought she was talking about the cancer and her diagnosis, but I believe now it was really, you know, like, just like she said it, the family's going to need you more. My wife, my daughter, our family's going to need you more when I do transition over because this cancer will kill me mom someday. It will, you know, I don't know when I hope I get to see my daughter graduate high school but it will kill me someday, mom. And they're going to need you to have your, your crap together. You know, yeah, you're, yeah. they're going to need you to have your crap together because uh, right now I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm in good hands. So uh, after she transitioned, what was your, what was your grief journey? How has it been so far? It was very horrifically hard. You know, yeah. losing a loved one is horrible regardless. Right. Uh, but losing a child, it is really just this tug of war with inside of yourself that you are wrestling with every single day. You know, the first moment that I got that phone call, um, it was at 1.30 on August the 10th, which was the time of our meeting, right? So I feel like that's a synchronicity. Our meeting oh, wow. was at 1.30, Candace transitioned at 1.30. It's um, one, we just started at 1 30 on August the 10th recording yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like that's her synchronicity. Her God went to me, right? Wow. For today. Um, leading up to that, you know, um, we were, as I shared, we were planning to go and visit. And I let her know in July when we left, um, you get strong, you do what you need to do. There was a couple of uh, protocols that she needed to accomplish before she could come home. I was like, and talked with her about that. Like, you, focus on doing those and we'll see you in August. So I love you. And she looked through me and like, I just looked through me, right? Like I was into my soul mm -hmm. and I knew at that very moment that I was not going to see her again living, but my denial subconscious mind mm -hmm. denied it and was like, Nope, we're going to see her on August. So we continued to plan our trip. And, um, on the, um, ninth, um, we were hearing that Candace was having complications. Um, you know, there was a, some high risk and complications over leading up from the eighth and the ninth. And then in that evening of overnight of the ninth, she slipped into a coma. And, um, my youngest daughter, Catalina called me and was like, I'm on my way to the hospital. Mom, you've got to get coming right now. We do not know how long it's going to be. Um, I'm too stay. I'm in San Antonio, Texas. They're in Colorado. So I'm freaking out. Um, and she's like, I'm on my way to the hospital. Candace is in a coma. You know, uh, I'll tell you more when I get there. And um, as Catalina arrived and spoke with her sister, Candace came out of the coma. Candace came out of the coma and acknowledged her sister. She wasn't able to talk, which the, the physicians and I, I assume she probably had a stroke, you know, which maybe compromised her voice and being able to talk. But she was very coherent from what they shared. She could move her head. She could move her fingers. She was a coherent. She was aware, you know, not her head. Yes or no. Mm -hmm. um, so then Katie calls me and says, um, Mom, um, Candace is out of a coma. Um, she can't talk, but you can talk to her if you want to say something to her you know, you can say something to her now. So I was like, okay, this was at 1230 on August the 10th when I had gotten that phone call from my daughter. Okay. And 
you were getting settled down. I'm like, okay, okay. So then I'm bracing myself for everything that, you know, I'm going to tell her and, um, forget ourselves positioned. And the nurse comes in and says, well, we need to change her coloscopy bag. And Katie had me on speaker and I was like, I love you, Candace. And um, we're going to talk here pretty soon. Uh, I love you. And, you know, um, Katie was like, she's shaking her head. She hears you. And Katie asked the nurse, well, can we stay in here while you change the, can I stay in here? She's talking to my mom. And but something happened where the nurse thought that it would be, you know, better if Katie left. But mm -hmm. um, also, you know, Katie had shared with me, you know, that Candace was kind of like motioning for her to leave the room. Right. And Katie just thought, well, she just wants some privacy. Why they change her colostomy back. But as soon as Katie stepped out of the room, that's when she transitioned. And uh, then, you know, that was at 12. When we were on the phone, Katie hung up and I think it's about 1245 Central Standard Time. So I'm waiting, knowing like I knew something just came over me and I just knew mm -hmm. that when I got that call, that that was going to be the situation, even though that's not what we talked about prior to us hanging up. Right. She said, well, I'll call you back, mom. They're going to change your clothes. Give me back. Call you back in a minute. And you can have your conversation with Candace. And I was like, okay, but I knew that from that moment, I just had gotten this cold chill in my body and mm -hmm. Katie calls at one thirty central standard time and said, she's gone mom. And that was uh, the day that our lives turned upside down. Yeah. And it was very struggle. You know, it, it still is from day to day life, a struggle. And one thing that I want to share with all parents, um, anyone, you know, but specifically to our parent community is that, you know, it is a horrific, horrible uh, black hole of abyss. You know, I felt like I was thrown in literally into this black hole abyss that just kept swirling around and around. And I had no roadmap, no compass, nothing, no sense of direction and the sense of just being lost. And in addition to being lost, I, a part of me died with her, you know, a part of my inside left with her and has, you know, transitioned with her. And that just set me on this, tell spin of yeah you know going through that process of not not wanting to survive not wanting to be here like even though I had three other children and two stepchildren and a beautiful family the grief just encompasses you and all you focus on is your loss and how horrific the pain is and the pain is just so horrific that it literally makes you feel like as if you're going mad you know and I knew right away, I got to do something. I made a promise to Candace and I love my children and I love my husband and my family. And I, I know that, you know, I, I need to be here for them. And for myself, Candace would not want me to continue feeling like this, even though I believe she understands, you know, what I'm going through from the other side. And I just started on this pathway of researching and having, um, more of a connection spiritually. And then that's when my intuitive abilities started really uh, all of my king senses, all of those other senses within me started heightening because my brain and all those other normal functions were shut down. They were not functioning, mm -hmm. I believe. So then my, my feelings, my, my intuition, my, uh, you know, mother's intuition, they call it got very intensely heightened and I just started researching more and more about what is grief. What is grief of a loss of a child? What does this do to your body? You know, how does this affect you, your health? Um, and how is this going to, you know, be for the rest of my life? And as I'm going through that journey, Brian, I had dreams of Candace. Candace came to me. I believe they're a visitation dream. She came to me first every month for six months with a message you know, of breadcrumbs, dropping those little breadcrumbs, helping me to understand what I was going through in addition to what I was learning um, medically and scientifically, right? And 
the first dream that I had of her was at two months of her crossing. Um, we celebrate, uh, you know, recognize my husband and I were recognizing that two month anniversary, playing her, her video, you know, music songs. She likes eating food. She likes, and, um, it came, you know, late in the evening, we're wrapping up and I'm getting ready for bed and just break down and our, just break down crying. And I just, you know, share with her. I, I can't do that. I just don't like crying anymore. I just don't want to cry anymore, Candace. I'm not mad at you. I just have so much pain in my heart. I just feel like I'm worthless. Like I'm just not able to do anything for anybody. I can't accomplish these tasks that I used to do or what I know I need to do in my heart. Hmm. And I went to sleep that evening and had a dream about her. And she said, came and visited. And we were um, in this home and my um, daughter Brandy was there with her son. And, and we were on the upstairs um, of the house and Brandy looks out the window and says, oh, Candace is here. And I'm like, what? In my dream, I knew, my conscious mind knew, how could she be here? Like mm -hmm. I knew that in my conscious mind. Right? That's when you and, know it's a visit. Yeah. Yes. And um, went downstairs and she was in the front door pathway. And I was just so surprised. Oh, Candace, you know, I remember asking her, wow, I thought that I would be down that list. I, I always felt like you would go see your wife and daughter first. Right. And are your siblings, you know, and she's like, well, puts her hand on her hip and she's looking up and she goes, well, mom, I'm here because you're the most open. Hmm. And I said, what? You know, I'm the what? She goes, you're the most open. You know, and she's just like looking up into the ceiling. And I just right then bawled, started crying, you know, and putting my face in my hands and sharing with her how I'm feeling, what, what life is like in reality, how I'm feeling. And she's just still standing in there with her head, her hand on her hip, you know, and looking up. And then she goes, mom, mom, mom. And a really loud voice. And I'm, I'm crying. My face is in my hands. I'm like, what, what? She said, I'm going to take enough hurt out of your heart so that you can get up and get some crap done. Cause mom, you need to get some crap done. And I said, what? You're going to do what? You know, and I'm crying. She's like, mom, I'm going to take enough hurt out of your heart so that you can get up and start getting some crap done. I love you. I got to go. And she leaves, you know, that's her personality. She was very straightforward. She would tell you, like I shared with mm -hmm. you earlier, the stuff you don't want to hear. Right. Mm -hmm. And I wake up the next morning and every day since that, Brian, my heart has filled, you know, like when you're when you're, when you're a child or when your children fall down, they scrape their knee, they get a really deep cut on their knee. And then that knee, that, that, that cut starts to scab over. Mm -hmm. But the inside of that wound's still kind of raw. It hasn't totally healed, but the outside of that wound's crusty and it's healing. Mm -hmm. That's how my heart feels. Mm -hmm. My yeah. heart feels like that deep inside of there. It's still wounded. It's still, you know, it could still be, you know, pussy and ooey. But around the crust of that, it feels like it's been crusted over and it's it's healed a little bit. Yeah. And that is how I've been able to get up and function. That moment that I woke up, I just was like, OK, I was able to get up, clean house, take a shower, eat, get back, you know, get out into the community, start volunteering um, continue to learn and stretch myself when it comes to um, grief and how to grow from grief and right. how to learn about, you know, my spiritual um, understanding of our loved ones are always with us mm -hmm. getting closer to that, you know? So it really started me on that pathway, but every month she would come with a message of some kind of knowledge. <laughs> and, and when was that first dream? Do you remember when it was? Yeah, it was on uh, August the 10th, two months of her transition. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then every she month would, after that, she would come with another, another every message. Month. For, yeah. Not on the 10th, not on the 10th, every month, it would be mm -hmm. a different time, but it'd be every month, different times of the month. Right. And then on the sixth month, she shared with me, mom, we don't need to do this anymore. I don't need to come and help you anymore. I'm always going to be here for you. I always be here with you, but I don't need to come and give you advice. You've learned so much. You're doing great. You've learned enough. You have enough knowledge to sustain yourself. And to help others, mom, you're going to, you're going to do great things in this world. You're going to do great things, mom, in the world. And 
And I didn't understand what that meant because we didn't even have the thought of the nonprofit at that time, you know? And I was, and I cried and I would be like, but I just, I I just don't, I I enjoy our monthly visits. I I look forward to them. She's like, mom, I'm always going to be around. I'll always be around. You don't need me to come every month anymore. Mom, you can do this. You can do this. You're awesome. You're great. You've got this. And don't forget, you're going to do great things in the world, mom. Now, did you know about dream visits before you started having these? What were, what were your beliefs before Candace transitioned? Yeah, not really. Um, I was and have always been religious and spiritual mm-hmm. um, and know that there is a heaven and and I believe in God and practice in that, but not to the magnitude of what I've gotten to, to be at in this level now mm-hmm. of just having those visits and talking about the, my spiritual grief therapist and helping them them helping me to be able to explore that knowledge Hmm. and understand that yes, there is a, uh, uh, after, you know, bond to bond that the, the, the physical body passes away, but the relationship doesn't ever die, you know, and learning that and learning that they are able to visit us in our dreams, send us signs and synchronicities. Um, If we believe, you know, if we believe and if we see that, then absolutely we can. And that's what I would like to share with our viewers today, Brian, is that when we are going through our loss, whether it be a child or any loved one, anyone that we love that we've lost that has shattered and rocked our world because they're not physically here anymore for them to to know that they're not alone and that they are able to have that connection with their loved one, does it think about it in this way? What was that relationship like when they were here physically? You know, what was that person like when they were physically here? Here, mm-hmm. and would they ever know that their person had, if they had an opportunity, would that would their loved one not come and visit them and not see them? You know, how was that? You know, if they were going to do that physically. To me, it only makes sense for us to think about they would find a way to do that Mm -hmm. after physical existence, right? Right. And and being able to comprehend that and understand that that physical, emotional, spiritual balance, I believe that is really what grief is all about, Brian, right? It's about us psychologically understanding how to balance the physical acknowledgement the acknowledgement excuse me of the physical existence is no longer here while balancing the fact that we still feel like we have a relationship with them and we still have this connection right we're trying to balance those two within ourselves within our minds and if we are in an in, in a situation where we may feel that we're not um supported by being able to express that, um, then that could make your brain become unbalanced, distorted. It could make that pain a lot more grie- uh, harder for you to grieve and absorb. If you're able to, I feel, to have that support and be able to talk about, well, I had a dream about my loved one last night. Oh, wow, I've seen this this um, coin. You know, I found this coin or I really feel connected to this. Whatever that connection is, our synchronicity is that you feel connects you to your loved one. Own that. Be proud of that. Don't let anybody rob you of that. Right. And talk about your loved one, however you feel is comfortable and learn how to honor your grief. Grief should be honored. You know, in my opinion, I've learned to honor it. I disliked it at the very beginning, but I honor it now. And I have a path with grief. And I think that if individuals consider having a pact with their grief and let their grief know, Hey, you're not going to leave. You're going to be here with me forever. That's a given, right? But let's make an agreement. I'll let you come out and be superstar every once in a while, because I, you need to do that. That's healthy for me, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to allow you to run my life and be superstar every day because I still need to be able to grow, stretch, um, touch others, be happy, and live this life in honor of my loved one and for my own innate creation. Wow. Wow. That, that was very well said. I I don't think I've ever heard a better definition of grief 
that that balancing of of the, the reality that the they're not here with us in the physical but we know that they're still here with us spiritually i think that's that's beautifully said and i love the way that you said you honor your grief because i think that's really important grief is going to be with us anyway we might, might as well make friends with it absolutely right let it know hey i know you're walking with me every single day because it is it truly really is right and for us to acknowledge that i that's what i've done I've made peace with my grief. I've honored it. I let it know, okay, you can come out when I feel like you, like that's good because that's healthy. I'm not going to hold you in. I'm not going to deny you. Right. Your time under the shine, you know, your time to shine. However, allow me my time to shine too because I have been created for a purpose and I have loved mm. ones that still love me and my my loved one would not want me to be always in the darkness. They would not want that for me. Beautiful. That's that's so beautifully said. I want to go back to something you said earlier about your intuition open up, opening up when you felt like your brain was not functioning properly. Uh, I think it's a really good point for a, a couple of different things. One is I truly believe that like people that can connect to the other side, they find a way to, to kind, of, kind of turn our, our brain down in a sense. But also I hear a lot of people say, well, your loved ones can't connect with you as long as you're in deep grief. And I know that drives some people crazy because they're like, well, of yeah. course I'm in grief. And I, so then they feel guilty because they're blocking their loved one. So I, I love that you shared that experience, the way that Candace came to you in your deep grief. Yes, I was in the heat of deep grief. My family was so worried about me. It was to the point where as I, you know, going back, rewinding back to the day when I got to call at 1.30, I knew instantly I have to take a time out from the world. I cannot go out. I, I, I am broken. I am, I am not myself. Something inside of me has died. I had to take a time out. And I know that everyone in the world is fortunate enough to be able to take a hiatus and be able to take, um, you know, as much time off six months. I took six months off. Right. Mm -hmm. I know that not everyone in the world is able to afford to do that, but I do ask everyone this, even if you don't have that opportunity to take six months off or even a, a week off, that's okay. Find time throughout your day when it's you in your home or whether you're going for a walk in the park or you're um, doing something that's solace and that's um, therapeutic for you and sit with your grief and have a really good conversation with it mm -hmm. and talk with it and let it know, you know, how you really feel. And that's what I've, I've done. I, I asked everyone, give it a chance. Give it a shot to talk with your grief. Find that five minutes. Let your family know, you know, I'm going to take five minutes out. You, maybe it's going to your bedroom. Maybe it's taking a bath. Maybe it's walking in the park. Regardless of whatever it is, try to find time throughout your day as often as you need to take that time or, or however you can afford to do that. And have those conversations with your grief so that you are able to really learn how to honor it. And it can, and it, and, and, and not just honor it, but honor in yourself. Right. Right. Well, um, if you ever decide you want to become a grief counselor, you'd be an excellent one. You're, you're, doing, you're doing a fantastic job right here now. And people are hearing, getting some great wisdom from you. I know you had some other experiences, right? I think you had some experiences involving your sister, Tanya. Yeah. Yes. So the, the year of 2021, when Candace transitioned, was a very tough year on our family. We lost several individuals one month right after the other. So Candace was the first to transition in August the 10th. My um, second oldest sister was at that same time diagnosed with cancer, and they were going through their journey around that uh, uh, the same time, right? Um, when Candace transitioned on August the 10th, then on September the 15th, my a second oldest sister transitioned also. Mm. And um, in October, we lost uh, my brother-in-law. To, to, uh, he got ill from COVID and we lost him. So three, three uh, deaths, three months in a row, right? Wow. Wow. And then later in that um, year, my oldest sister was diagnosed with cancer esophagus cancer and she lost her son in December of that same year. 
Um, so we had a lot of loss, a lot of trauma, a lot of changing that was going on within our, our family. It was just like layering and, and layering. And then that really got me thinking a lot about my grief, right? Didn't even have the opportunity to get through the grief of the mm. loss of my child. And now I'm losing my sister and now I'm losing my brother-in-law. And now I'm facing the fact that my oldest sister has got cancer now. And now, we, now we've lost my nephew. Mm. So being able to process through all of that helped me to really understand on this researching. I started going to school to learn how to be a, a life coach, you know, um, about grief therapy and relationships, but also for my own. And I would, uh, my own self benefit as well and researching and reading and fundamentally it really is, is when you go through trauma of any magnitude, doesn't necessarily have to be a loss, right? Like my family went through losing someone or losing a job too, or losing someone or having to move to another state, whatever that dynamic is, that's still grief, right? I learned if I, I had to handle them like I eat my meals one bite at a time, right? I had to handle each grief separately because it all definitely is two a very separate grieving processes. Sure. And, and honoring those grieving processes very separately and in understanding that, you know, they're still with me, but going through that and being able to grow and stretch instead of just coupling them all in one big grief bucket, respecting and honoring that grief. Um, and I believe that like, if we are able to do that, I know at least for me, Brian, being able to separate out those griefs of losses of my family and honoring each one of them as they were in their existence as human beings and my relationship with them really has helped me to honor the grief even more and honor myself and honor them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, um, I'd like to, to talk about the Captain Cookie or Captain Candace Cookie Ruiz Foundation. But before I do that, I, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge you and Candace and how special you are. I mean, I've, I've known you for about six months now. So uh, a little bit after your daughter transitioned and where you are, you know, just two years to the day and it's just it's incredible. And it's it's a, a you know, you you talk about how, Can how special Candace is and her growing up and her her heart of service. And I can see, you know, all those things in you as well. So I, I know you guys share that. So this foundation that you've started, this nonprofit that you've already got up and running, you've got a website, you've got a board of directors, and I know how hard it is to, to do a nonprofit. So tell me about it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. So the Captain Candace Cookie Ruiz Foundation, also referred to as CKCRF, was created in honor of Captain Candace, uh, my oldest daughter. Um, we are created to support um, military uh, civilians and athletes, rugby athletes with out of pocket comprehensive support. For the military and our civilians, we're supporting them with out of pocket comprehensive support in the area of if they choose to take their cancer pathway down a holistic, natural, pathic, or integrative pathway of treatment. We support with out of pocket um, support. So, with these types of treatments for um, natural, pathic, integrative, holistic, majority of that type of treatment may not all be covered under their medical insurance or under their military benefits. So when they work with, when they work with their, um, when they work with their physician and um, get that treatment plan solidify, mm -hmm. then they find out what that out of pocket um, portion is going to be. And if they're not able to afford to do that, pocket uh, out of pocket process on their own, then they would come to CKCRF and we will work with them on getting this um, covered for them. And for our uh, rugby athletes, we are supporting them in the area of gear, if they need gear, or if they need uh, support with travel and uh, hotel stay, we support them with that as well. We have an intake form out on our website that they can go out and review and complete for our cancer a community, a military civilian, and for our rugby community, they can go out and check that out, fill out that intake, and they would get a, a phone call within 24 hours from an intake representative that would walk them through and talk a little bit more about that intake. And then we would work 
directly with the physicians that they have listed on there. Um, if the uh, patient has not sought out uh, an alternative um, treatment plan, we do have a directory on our website that will assist them with going out and finding that for them to go out and explore those physicians and our uh, healing, um, holistic healing directory where they can find a natural uh, pathic integrative um, physician, have that consultation with them, decide if that treatment is right for them and if they're accepted for that program of treatment. And once they've gotten that all covered with their medical physician and they're finding that they're needing that support, that they were more than happy to help them um, with that part. That's that's just amazing. That's, that's amazing that the the work that you're doing. As I said, the fact that you've got that that up and running uh, at this point that's fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate it. And um, you know, we have a great uh, team of board of directors and a wonderful staff, and all of our partners that we have partnered with um, to assist us with our website uh, website design, with our consultations of strategic planning. Everyone, and this is totally a team effort, and I truly believe that um, God and Candace um, laid this inside of us um, to create this, um, because that's what I really believe now when she shared with me at the six month mark, mom, you're going to do great things in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what are you talking about? Great things in the world. I'm just an average everyday person. But now in hindsight with this nonprofit, I truly believe that that was the that was the God wink that she was giving me. She was letting mm -hmm. me know that this is good for the world. The world does need this. They do yeah. need the support. And for them to know that we understand their journey. We understand that journey of cancer. And if they choose to want to do a, a part chemotherapy, part radiation, but have some holistic integrative therapies to help them with their, with their nausea or to maintain that, um, those um, after effects of those systems. We help those with that type of pathway as well. It doesn't have to be a hundred percent treat that treatment plan, but they have the hard job. Our job is to be there to help them have the peace of mind to do what they need to do best. And that's get well. Yeah. So have you done anything like this before Kat? I mean, this is, I'm still just flabbergasted. Done what? Put, to put yeah. together a nonprofit or anything. I mean, how, what was your background no. before this? Well, my background is in um, adult learning, and right. I, um, as it shares on the website, that I have a, ba a bachelor's degree, double major in um, criminal justice, paralegal science, and right. adult learning. And yeah. that's my pre predominant role currently as a uh, adult educator. I publicly speak and um, facilitate um, to adults, and um, but with the legal mind and just you know this passion going to school, I did go to school for this. I got my um, IAP uh, nonprofit certificate. Okay. Um, when I started going through this journey, shared with our board and our staff and shared with them, you know, um, I'm going to go to school and learn what this is all about because I want to make sure that we cross every I, uh, every T and dot every I. Right. has our, my daughter's name on it, your sister, your wife, like our loved one's name on it. And um, this is for humanity. So let's do it right. Let's uh, measure twice, cut once, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. we're moving forward with that. Well, you're an absolute model for how to deal with grief. I, I mean, I love what you, you know, you, you haven't denied your grief. You've, you've honored your grief. You have taken this, this tragedy of your, of your young daughter, you know, transitioning uh, in such a way and turned it into a blessing for the world. Uh, you, it's just, it's fantastic. Well, thank you, Brian. I really appreciate that. And truly, really, I believe that it is a blessing. You know, it's a tragic that we lost Candace and my sisters and my brother-in-law and any loved one, right? It's mm -hmm. a tragic whenever you lose someone that you love. And I, I struggled with that for a really long time of that, what good can come out of the fact that I don't have my daughter? There's nothing good from, that comes from this, right? Mm -hmm. But going through, you know, the journeys that I've had with having those uh, dream visits, having the the intuition, the breadcrumbs, <laughs> and I follow the breadcrumbs, learning more about grief, going to school and learn how to, the, the, the medical aspect of grief. 
and the spiritual side of grief, Mm -hmm. it really is something good can come out of it. And I know now, at least for me and my experience, I would have never have been this person the way that I am now, had I not have lost my daughter. I truly, really believe and share with my family and staff that this is what I was created to be. This is what God created me to be. He created me to be a server in the community and to help others understand that you're not alone and to educate them and to help them have that support of uh, understanding themselves, understanding what they're going through and helping them, letting them know you're not alone. Um, I've always been a teacher my whole life. I went to school for that. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. I think with this added experience is that was all school for me. Everything that I've done up until this point was school. It was teaching me and priming me for this very moment, for that moment when I lost my Candace, you know, and that's, that is the good, right? And I feel at least that for me, like the grief was expected to happen, even though we didn't think that it was going to happen, you know, Um, but there is a purpose for each and every one of us as human beings. You know, we are soul beings. We're not just human beings. We have a spirit inside of us and We have a divine innate purpose that we were created to, to accomplish. It's tapping into that. And sometimes you don't always, at least for me, I didn't figure it out and know it until I was going through my worst horrible time in my life. Mm -hmm. What you just said, it reminded me of something I just had on my my program recently. And she went through a very terrible time and she talked about how she turned her tragedy into something and the way she described it. And I can't say it exactly, but it's kind of like she, she took what was given to her and she she transformed it, she transmuted it, and she said, and I'm giving it back to you, to, you know, God, as as a gift. So I want to say, you know, the this good has not just come out of your grief. You've actually you've created it. You've taken your grief and you you've worked. I mean, this is this isn't just didn't just happen. Um, you've worked to create this thing out of out of the tragedy. And that's a that's a fantastic testament to who you are as a creator. I appreciate that. Thank you so very much. I, I feel like I didn't, I I know I didn't do it physically on my own creating this nonprofit, but um, spiritually inside of me, you know, the, the love that I feel for my sisters, my, my daughter, God, um, they've propelled me and they have so encouraged me every single day. Um, I believe that you asked me earlier and I kind of glossed over it about the story about my sister, Tanya, right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and knowing this and this help is what I mean. So this story will make sense to what you've just shared about um, what I'm doing, what we're doing for this nonprofit is mm-hmm. um, with my oldest sister being diagnosed with cancer. She was my mother figure. My mother passed away as I shared at 14 years of age with breast cancer. And um, she raised me and my younger brother. So she was more like a mother figure to us. And we were very close and, you know, loved her very much. And when she got her diagnosis, we thought, okay, everything's going to be okay. She's going to get over it. She wasn't that far uh, long in the diagnosis of a stage four. She was, you know, more on a stage one or two. But as it continued to progress, she's getting worse. That becomes a part of your life. When you have a sick individual that has a long, a long illness, you start to assimilate with that way of life. It starts to become a part of your life. The, the fear is always there, but you just know that this is the norm that that individual is going to have this type of day. And that's just the way that it's going to be, you know? Well, that's how it was for us. We started getting a little bit more adjusted to her illness and she was in and out of the hospital. She got to a point point in her journey where she was able to come home. My niece called me. I would call every day. She lives in Missouri. I live in Texas. I would call every day and check on her. Like I always had prior to her illness. And, um, my niece was sharing with me, well, she's home. She's seeming to do a lot better. She had to have a trach put in her throat. She had, um, esophagus cancer. Mm-hmm. So they put a trach in she's doing well. You know, she seems to be, uh, adjusting to the trach very well. Everything's good. So I'm like, wow, it's a side of relief. Wow. She's doing good. Right. So I go off to sleep that evening 
and at about have this dream that she comes to visit. She comes to visit me. My sister and I hadn't been able to physically see each other for about 10 years since I moved to Texas. Things would just happen to where we just, we would FaceTime. We were always connected every day, but physically being in the same place, we just didn't have that. Some, you know, the world just didn't, timing was always off. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I shared with her, well, if you get well and you get out of the hospital, I'm going to come in March. And that's March of this year, 2023. I'm going to come in March and this is you. We're going to have such a great time. And she had come home that very um, last uh, day of, of uh, February. I went to sleep and I dreamed she came. I heard knock on my door, open the door. Here she is. She's Hey, sister, you know, how happy. She looked about 30 years younger, very healthy, very, you know, happy. And behind her was Candace. And they come walking in and we start walking in this, in this, uh, it's like we leave and we're walking in this park. We find ourselves in this park and I can hear the birds chirping and we're excited. And She's in the middle and I'm on one side and Candace is on the other side and we're walking. And the weird thing about that dream was I, for a moment in the dream, thought, Candace, why are you here? You shouldn't be here. Like I knew then again that she shouldn't be there. And I'm thinking in the dream that this is a, you know, a, a visit from my sister. I, I, at that time, she was still alive. Right. right. So. Candace didn't include herself, but she didn't exclude herself from the dream either, Brian. You know, she just walked with her head down, you know, and me and my sister are just catching up. Giddy as all could be talking. And I was like, see, I told you I'd come and see you. And she was like, uh-uh, I can't be see you. Like that. And we have, I start laughing. Yeah. You know, we thought it was just so um, fun that, yeah, you're right. You did come to see me, right? And we're talking and we're talking and we get to this point in the dream where she stops walking and she places her hand on my chest and she says, I want to let you know that you are the best baby sister. I am so glad to have you as my baby sister. You are so, so amazing. You always was the pretty sister. And I'm like, no, you're pretty too. You know, Maria's pretty too. And that's not true. And she's like, you're pretty in here, Kathleen. You're pretty in here. And don't let anybody ever tell you anything different. And I want you to know I'm your biggest fan and I will always be your biggest fan. I'll always support you. You do amazing things for people. And I'm like, oh, you do amazing things too, you know? And so we're going back and forth and she's like, we got to go. Candace and I have this event. We're so excited. We got this event that we're going to go to. It's just for Candace and I, we are so excited. And she was like, and you can't come, you can't come. And I was not upset. I was like, oh, okay. Well, y'all enjoy your time together, you know, have fun. She was like, we'll see you later. You'll be able to come to the event later. It's not, you can't come to this one. Right. Mm -hmm. And I woke up at four o'clock feeling still her essence, her presence, still feeling mm -hmm. her hand on the, my chest. For about two minutes, I just laid in bed and just absorbed that and was so excited, right? And shared with my husband, man, I can't wait till I get off of work because I'm going to call my niece and tell my sister about this amazing dream that I had about her and I. Well, that same day, March 1st, 12 o'clock, I get the call that my sister had transitioned over. Mm. And I asked my niece, well, what time did she leave? What time did she transition? And my niece said, well, probably anywhere, uh, possibly from four o'clock to nine o'clock, right? Well, that was when I woke up from my dream. So I feel in my heart, like I just felt her in my heart that that was her way of saying her coming and seeming, saying hello and goodbye and letting me know, giving me that peace and having that, my grief is terrible and I miss her, but it sure did give me so much peace. It really did give me a lot of peace and helped me to be able to adjust to the loss of her physical existence. Yeah. And 
shortly after that, throughout the same month of March, on the 28th of March, um, in the shower, just sending her loving vibes, you know, thinking about her, uh, manifesting on her and giving her love and sharing with her how much I hope she's, I just know she's so happy and I'm just so glad that she's so happy and how much I love her. And as I went into the shower, you know, I put my items down. The, the dragonfly was not there when I got into the shower, but sending her those loving vibes, I got out of the shower. There's a dragonfly on my jeans Mm -hmm. and I'm like, calling my husband, what is, come here, come here. I need you to confirm two things for me. What is that? And he's like, that's a dragonfly. And I'm like, how did he get in here? And he goes, well, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I feel like that was a sign, right? It wasn't there before I got in the shower. It wasn't flying around in my house. My, my cat probably would have killed it, you know? Um, it was there right when I got out of the shower, sitting there, like almost as if it was like wink, waving at me, like, hi, yeah, you know? Yeah. So those are the things that I want our audience to take into consideration that, yes, we are battling with inside of ourselves an internal process of accepting the physical existence is no longer there and the connection with them. But being able to have synchronicities and signs and connecting with them when we, that's their way of letting us know that they're not going to ever leave us, you know, and that they're always going to be there for us to give us comfort. We just have to, you know, ask ourselves, do we want to believe that? And if we do, and we feel it, then be grateful for that and say, thank you. Absolutely. Well, Kat, um, that was a beautiful, beautiful way to, I think, end our, our time together today. So what I'd like for you to do is tell people where they can find the foundation. Um, so just let people know where they can find you. Sure. You can um, search for us. Our website is uh, CaptainCandiceCookie.org. That's C-A-P-T-A-I-N-C-O-O. Um, excuse me, back up. Captain, C-A-P-T-A-I-N, Candice, K-A-N-D-I-S-C-O-O-K-I-E.org. Yeah, it's it's a great website. I was just checking it out myself. And Kat, you are just an inspiration. So thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you for having me. All right. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. You too.